All right, welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil. I'm Treacherous Trista. I'm Tom Woodruff Jr. Yes, very good, very good. This is, this is, uh, you need a cool name. Not that that's not a cool name, but uh, it's it's cooler than my dad's name because I added Junior to the end of it. Right. Which was which is awkward now yeah, because when I first did it, uh, my dad's no longer with us. When but when I first did it, he was, and I thought, well. You know, the uh, I guess it makes sense. I'll leave Junior. It's always been, you know, my dad's name, Junior. Um, and now over the years, it's become like the it's the whole Lon Chaney Jr. thing. Right. When Lon Chaney was alive, uh, you know, Lon, it was Lon Chaney Jr. Then after his dad died, he just became Lon Chaney. But if I change my name now to just Tom Woodruff without Junior, then I've got to redo all my Amazon accounts and right. everything online. It's uh, a big hullabaloo. Yeah, it is. A, it is. I'm glad to hear you say hullabaloo. Yeah, I like to bring that back. Terms. I think it's a good word. I feel Trista. I, I I'm worried. Do, do you you know Lon Chaney is right? Yeah, um, I so. do. <laughs> I have to be, I have to be careful. But but if Neil's gonna say hullabaloo, then I can say Lon Chaney Jr. I like that you're insinuating that Neil appears much older than me. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I, yeah, it might just be. It's a, it's a, he's an old soul. We could. We oh, could. Yeah, yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, what did was your dad involved in uh, the in show business? Nah. No, not at all. Not at all. By the way, terrible Troy is with us. I was not sure if he was going to be here, so I did not. Uh, but he is here. Made the scene. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what did he think uh, of you wanting to uh, to get involved in movies? Oh, he, uh, he thought it was great. You know, it's like it's like you know, I grew up in, in obviously a whole different generation, but 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 I, I was in a generation where it's something I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Okay, and and I thought I want to move to Hollywood and I want to make monsters for movies and. Um, and it wasn't like he ever, it, it's not like we sat down, right? It's not like he said, okay, as, a, as the adult, as your parent, it's time for me to help you plan out your future. Now let's think about, you know, what are worthwhile jobs? What will bring you satisfaction? What would be good financial uh, choices? I do, you know, back then it was just like, uh, oh, where's Tom today? Oh, he got in the car yesterday and drove to, Ho drove to Hollywood to, to work with movies. So it was very, it was just the way it was back then. You know, it's like, uh, Oh, when my wife and I, you know, got to the stage in our lives where we started to have kids, then it became it, we were we were very aware of not wanting to be uh, what they call them uh, hel helicopter parents, where you're just over your kids' shoulders at all times and and sort of taking away the the uh, impetus to to make your own decisions. So that's where I was. I was just I was you know of a lucky uh, of a lucky generation to just be able to take off and and not have it planned out ahead of time. Yeah. So you said you wanted to make monsters. So that was always the goal. Like that was what you set up to do. Yeah, yeah. If if I'd known it, if I'd known it was going to come true that easily, I should have said, uh, "I want to be president, or I want to be the ruler of America, or I want to be take over the world." And it would just happen, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it was. I was very. Um, you know, I made that plan when I was uh, about eight years old. You know, so I'm living the life, the perfect life of an eight year old. So what what was it about monsters that, that captured you? Oh God, I don't know. I, I, I could probably best describe it as combination of, 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 an, of, a, uh, of an old monster magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland, which is which was basically all that was available to 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 people, you know, people that became makeup artists and monster makers of my of my generation. There they just were, were not that many uh, competing choices. And then uh, um, watching all the old uh, Universal monsters on TV, you know, late Friday night, you know, trying to stay awake through the commercials and, and invariably missing half of them anyway. Um, you know, no DVD, no VHS and no streaming. Just, you know, you kind of count ahead. You look ahead in the TV guide and you plan on, uh, oh, I'm going to watch a, uh, a Ray Harryhausen movie this weekend and, uh, you know, get through part of it. But, but yeah, that was, uh, it, that was, it was that early in my life that, that I decided that that's what I wanted to do. It's weird you mention that because, uh, you know, I watch all this stuff too growing up. Ray Harryhausen is one of my favorites. But uh, there's something, it's cool that you can watch any of that stuff pretty easily now. You can find it streaming or you can buy DVDs. 
but there is something special about having to to watch it at a certain time. You know, it's funny you say that because I will still watch, you know, on Saturday nights on me TV um, and I'm not being paid to plug them, <laughs> but if I say me TV three times, me TV will send me a check. Um, no, on me TV on Saturday nights, there's this great uh, horror TV host, Sven Gooley. Yeah. And, you know, I was never into the whole horror host thing because, you know, as a, uh, <laughs> as a 10 year old, you know, experimenting with makeup and playing around stuff stuff i was very serious i didn't like people making fun of these old monster movies but man all, you know all these years later it's just like sven gooley is just such a uh, he's such a great draw you know he's, he's he's very clever he's very funny and he talks about the history of the movie so he, he adds some legitimacy to it. it it's great i love it but there is something that that i may have the dvd sitting on a shelf but if Sven Gulli's, you know, brings up a movie, I'll sit there and watch it. There's something again. It's sort of like that uh, that whole. I want to be with an audience, knowing that there's there's people all over the country watching that movie at the same time I'm watching it. And and uh, you're right. There is there is something that's more. Um, you know, if you have to wait for a movie or 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 you're somehow there's there's some kind of constraints put on it. It's um it does make it more uh, compelling sometimes. Yeah, I think even. Uh... Because now you can binge watch TV shows, which I which I do too. But uh, if you are watching a show live, uh, we have to watch it every week. There is something that it does you, you pay more attention to it too. I think you do, and and you want to stay up with with your friends that are watching it too. So so like the next morning, you don't want to hear somebody talking about what happened last night when you didn't see it. You know, you want to be there and kind of kind of talk it over. Yeah. So what were the monsters, Universal Monsters, Harryhausen? Were there any specific monsters that really captured you? Oh, anything that was in black and white mm -hmm. <laughs> would capture me. Um, and it's funny, too, having, having grown up, early movies, you know, there were some early uh, Universal Monster movies that just didn't, you know, that didn't click with me, like Dracula. I thought Dracula was, was, was ter terribly boring, um, guy didn't have any fangs. Bella Lugosi didn't have any fangs. But um, as I as as I got older, I've really started to appreciate that uh, that original Lugosi Dracula because there's some really creepy things about it. In, in fact, one thing I like about a lot of those old Universal movies were they had this quality to the sound that if, if everybody stopped talking, you'd hear the soundtrack, which you know, it's like a weird kind of back. And I started to equate that with just an, an uneasy feeling, you know, and, and I ended up really, uh, really liking the same with the uh, original Mummy with Karloff. Um, boring, boring, boring movie when you're a kid. He's only wrapped up in that look, in that mummy look for like the first five minutes yeah. of the movie. And then it's like, wow, I'm watching something different now. You know, who cares? But um, again, now just just having fallen in love with that story and, and what all this, how the, all those characters interact. Uh, I, I love the movie. It's um, just on its own right, not because it's an old universal classic, but it's a great, uh, it's really a great film. Yeah, and, and they and they still hold up. And the, the effects still hold up too, I think. And I, I agree, I still, I, you know, so many people agree again, my generation, you know, the, 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 the very best Frankenstein ever done was Karloff's original. And Bride of Frankenstein, you know, yeah. great character stuff. Yeah. And years, we'll jump around, I guess, but years later, you know, you get to play in the Monster Squad. Uh, what was that experience like? Because you're recreating the, uh, the the original Universal Monsters. It was, well, it, it was it was really cool. It was like, it was probably, uh, you know, I was working for Stan Winston and and that was a great time, you know, in my life, you know, having having moved cross country and um and then we th this movie you know lands uh, lands at stan winston's and he comes out and he tells us guys i'm going to start this movie soon it's called the monster squad here take the script home read it and um at that time the talk was that we you know working at stan's were going to be able to recreate the original universal monsters and that's always like a, a, a really uh a real high to think that 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 we could put our thumbprints on the original on these original monsters and, and immediately i started thinking because i always loved the creature from the black lagoon and okay that's great there's a guy that doesn't have to talk so i don't have to memorize any lines i don't have to worry about 
about my my speaking voice, my acting voice, whatever. I could just wear the rubber suit and do the cool stuff. And um, and it was great the day I went went and, and asked Stan about it. And he said, let me check with the producers, but it's okay with me. And 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 that came through. So um, that was really exciting. And and shortly before we all started production, you know, drawing and designing and, and sculpting, um, word came back that that Universal uh, didn't reach an agreement with with the producers of the film. So um, we had all kind of put a different spin on all the characters. So Stan, what did he do? He got in the design room and he drew up the, the Gill Man and the Frankenstein monster and the mummy and well, and the wolf man. So he did those 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 four main characters. And um, of them all, I would I got to sculpt the Frankenstein makeup that Stan designed and I got to play the the creature uh, the Gill Man that um, Stan designed and, and and Steve Wang and Matt Rose sculpted. So it was just it was just a, a real a real great time. Yeah. Did uh, did you actually sculpt the original ones before? Like that you could I mean, use just for fun. Yeah. Uh, before you knew that you couldn't use them. No, no, we didn't get that far. No, we didn't. Luckily, they they got us. They stopped us in time. <laughs> They stopped us. I, <laughs> I don't know why I just thought of this. I remember after we knew we were going to do our own originals, Stan came out with the uh, the drawing of the, the the Gill Man. He was showing to us, huh? Huh? Looking at it, and he goes, goes, yeah. I, I I want to spray some crystal clear, you know, some clear sealer over it. And picked up a can and he's shaking it. And he's talking, blah, blah blah blah, and he just hits it with a blast of this crystal clear, which actually turned out to be black spray paint. And right across his drawing, you see all this spatter of black. And he's, he was, we were lucky there was enough there to see what we were sculpting. So uh, this was before computers, you know, and Photoshop and, and all that jazz that would have preserved, preserved the uh, original arts. But uh, it turned out fine. It worked out in the end. Yeah, yeah. that's one of my favorites, too, is actually uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. And one of the highlights of the show was having Ben Chapman on uh, early on in, in the when we started. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. You, wow, have, that's you cool. Did you meet him or Rico? Rico Browning? Have I met him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, and again, when I first, I don't know what the reason was when I was a kid, you know, reading these monster magazine, I always was, I was more familiar of Rico Browning mm -hmm. as the creature than Ben Chapman. It turned out the deal was that Ben Chapman was doing all the acting mm -hmm. stuff and when he's out on land. Rico did all the swimming stuff. But um, it was funny because, we were working on. Uh, I was in, I was in the UK working on Aliens with you know understand Winston with with the guys, and I was talking to somebody that was on our crew like the um, camera operator or something. I was just talking about the work he was doing, and I don't even know how it came up. But he said, "If you ever get the chance to work with this second unit director, do it because he's great. His name's Rico Browning. Rico Browning went on and became a big second unit director. I think he did." Oh, now everybody's going to check on this real quick. I think he might have done one of the Bond movies. I don't know. Oh, I actually know that. But I mean, he was doing, I mean, he was doing high level, you know, second unit directing. He also, um, he also created the, uh, the TV series uh, Flipper back in the 60s. Which, now I'm looking at everybody's face. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knows what I'm I talking know, about. Flipper. <laughs> you know, the annoying dolphin flipper. Right, right. Um, so yeah, so he was a, a creative guy. So a few years ago at Monster Palooza, which is the uh, the big show, you know, out in LA in the springtime, uh, big convention. It's all about monster artists and 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 uh, guests. And uh, um, Rico was scheduled to be there to give a talk. So the uh, the organizer of the event, I asked him if I could do the the interview because I was such a fan. So I got to interview Rico Browning and talked about his early career. And he was so glad that I had somehow heard that he was more than just the guy in the rubber suit. So it was really a fun, a fun uh, in, uh, introduction and 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 talk with him. Mm -hmm. Now, when you did the sculpting, you know, you wanted to put your own spin on it because you couldn't use Universal. But how about uh, your movements and stuff? Did you watch, you know, the original one to kind of pattern it off that? Or? Yeah, I think, you know, I um, first time I put on the foam rubber suit before it was even trimmed or painted. I, I remember one of the guys working at Stan said, said, have you worked out? Have you worked out your walk yet? Have you worked out how you're going to walk? And I thought, what? 
what do you mean work out my walk? I thought I would just put on the monster suit and just, you know, and and it, and, it, and I, I just kept thinking about, I, I suddenly thought I've got all this responsibility to make sure this thing looks great. And and I worked out the walk and it was, you know, it wasn't anything specific, but just, just kind of something that wasn't just like a guy, you know, walking down the street, I'm a scary monster, but it was, it was having some kind of a, a fluid movement. And then, uh, you know, just, just making sure that it, it, uh, we could do what we could to lessen the effect of a man walking down the street. Mm -hmm. now, I've always loved the monster squad, but, um, it didn't really do very well at the time, but it seems like over the years, it's really found an audience, but yeah, you're right. No, you're right. It, 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 I think it did really badly when it was first released. And then there was something, some kind of a tie up with the rights, you know, because I think it came out on VHS. I don't know. I think it came out in VHS, but, but then it disappeared and, and it took years and years and years before it finally got released on uh, uh, Laserdisc. And then, then when it hit DVD, it, the fans just came out of nowhere and they completely embraced it. Mm -hmm. So what was that like though at the time? Because I, you know, it, I would think it's a personal movie for you growing up with Universal Monsters, and then you make the movie and it, it didn't do very well. Yeah, well, it's like uh, what is it? Stan used to say, um, you yeah, know, he has no control over how the movies do; just he has control over what he provides to the movies. So it was sort of it was very humbling, you know. But but um, I also remember all the time I was growing up. It wasn't like it wasn't like I was one of the cool kids because I liked monster movies. You know, that was not a, I, I get that. Yeah. That was not a good call. I did not have, I did not have girls lining up to be asked to the prom because I like monsters. Right. So, um, so I, I'm kind of used to just like monster movies, pro wrestling, dungeons and dragons and chess clubs. So yeah, very, very cool guy. Yeah. And if we're lucky after the prom, we'll sit in my mom's basement and watch an old movie. Um, yeah, so I, I was I was used to I was used to not having a big fan following <laughs> in, in anything that I did. Did you know that the movie had a following like before it came out on on DVD? And no, no, I, I would occasionally see you know people asking, "What's going on? Where's Monster Squad? How come we can't find it?" And and I never even knew the answers. You know, I don't know. No, but it was it was it was a really nice surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, Trust, do you have a question? I have to ask what it was like working on a Mike Nichols film. Uh, that was that was a, a totally uh, unexpected blast uh, because you know you think of all the things I've done and 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 if you would say, "Gee, what's your favorite film?" You know, it would surprise people to say The Graduate because of Mike Nichols' work because I love directing and I love watching directors work. And I remember that that when that movie first came out. It was uh, like 68 or something, right? Late 60s. And it had an M rating, which was for mature audiences. And, and I, you know, I never saw it. Uh, shortly after that, it would come out on TV and it would be cut, you know, because there's some suggestion of nudity and stuff. It would be cut. And the movie made no sense to me. I couldn't care for it. But then in, in like 1972, I think, or 74, it was re-released to theaters. And I used to work at the theater in town and change the marquee. So I would just walk in and watch the movie for free. And uh, and I totally got it. I totally fell in love with with the movie and the whole the whole style of, of the directing and the performances. So that became my favorite movie. So so uh, that's one of those movies that 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 I would have never expected having grown up as I did with the interest I did to, to be able to work with a, 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 such a, a, a huge creatively successful uh, artist like Mike Nichols, which also led, which also led to us working for Nora Ephron on, on Michael, on the movie Michael, where we created big uh, angel wings for John Travolta. I mean, that came our way, you know, uh, Norma, Nora Ephron, you know, a, a, a romantic comedy uh, director. Um, that would have never happened, but she was part of the, the whole New York vibe of directors. So Mike Nichols had her contact us and that was also, you know, another another great surprise. Now, when you mentioned Stan Winston a couple times earlier, uh, how, how did you get involved with Stan Winston working with him? Um, once I landed in, in Los Angeles, I had a portfolio of things I had done on my own, some makeups and some masks and some models and stuff. And, um, and I was showing those around and 
after about six months, I got a job uh, working at a, a place called Makeup Effects Lab. And we were working on a movie called Metal Storm. And it was low budget, well, low budget science fiction. But I got to do everything. I learned how to make molds, sculpt, design, paint, do up makeups. It was, it was probably one of the best boot camps experience I've ever had. But, but once that work ended, a couple of the guys that I had met, and we really clicked because we're, you know, it's all just kids. And, and after, after that movie uh, ended, we all kind of went our own ways. And two of these guys landed with Stan Winston's team on a pilot that they were working on. And, and Stan had this other movie coming in, which was The Terminator. Nobody knew what it was at the time. And he asked, Stan asked the, these guys, you know, who else do you know? Because I need somebody else. They said, oh, try, try Tom Woodruff. And, and, and so they called me in and I got there and I think I, I, uh, I was there for about five years after that, starting with Terminator. So you, you said no one knew what, you know, Terminator. Uh, when you're making that, I know it's a weird, people probably ask all the time, but did you realize like this is something special? This is going to be, you know, this yeah, iconic. I, 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 uh, I had not read a lot of scripts at that time. By that time, you know, I'd only been out there for a, uh, a few years, uh, two years, two years, two and a half years. And, um, but when we got the script to read, I took that home and read it. And I thought it was the best story I'd ever heard of. I thought it was going to be the such a cool movie and 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 it really was oh yeah you know is that the uh well i guess that's the first time you worked with james cameron so. yeah yeah and then we followed that up after uh afterwards with with aliens you know another huge a huge you know <laughs> a huge uh, a confirmation of being in the right time at the at the right at the right place at the right time because uh, you know had i not been there for terminator i don't know that i would have ended up at stan winston's mm. And uh, Lance Henriksen, who I saw, like, was also in one of your short films. So you worked with him quite a bit. Yeah. Lance Henriksen fan. Oh, Lance is our, Lance is like our, uh, is like our third partner. We, I think, um, I, I think between Alec and I, you know, using him in different, you know, Alec had Lance star in his feature, in Alec's feature, Harbinger Down, and I had him in my short and, and, um, and we had done, you know, also films, Pumpkinhead and Aliens and, right. But I, I, last time I counted, I think there's seven different projects that that Lance and I have worked on together, and he's just he's just an, an, an amazing guy. I just it, it, everything he does, he's so committed to everything he does. Was, I did that short that you just mentioned. I did that short, and I'm playing a small part in it, and I'm doing this scene with Lance, and I suddenly inside I'm going, I shouldn't be here. You know, I don't know enough about acting. And I'm a, a, a opposite this guy, and it was just—it was just amazing how he would just get into his character, and and he's—he's he's such a, a practiced, uh, practiced performer and practiced actor that, that that I can't say enough good things about him. That stood out. I don't know if you ever read his book, Not Bad for Humans. Yeah, I yeah. love that book, and I always remember that part where he talks about working on Piranha Two, and a lot of the people on Piranha Two like kind of treat it as like ah, it's just this dumb movie, it doesn't matter. But, you know, he gave it his all and so did James Cameron, who directed it. And uh, he remembered that. And that's how it led, you know, to them working together on movies down the road. And yeah. it just showed that, you know, no matter what you're doing, you should still, you know, work your best on it. You know, absolutely. I mean, that, that sort of goes back to Monster Squad I, in the opposite way. I did I did the best I could with, with what I knew, what I was able to do at the time and and and, uh, and just trusted that it was going to work out as long as I was committed to doing the best I could do. Um, that was what was expected of me. So uh, did you and James Cameron know each other at all before the movie? No, no, I, I only met, uh, I only met James Cameron uh, during Terminator. And uh, from what I understand, I don't know if you know anything about this at land originally Lance was going to play the Terminator. We had a, uh, we had a piece of art at Stan's shop that, 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 that Jim, that James Cameron had done on a piece of black, uh, uh, black paper it, it, with colored pastels, and it was basically Lance's face in that in that drawing, you know, holding the gun up like this, which which later they converted it to to Arnold's face. But yeah, that was the plan that it was originally going to be Lance. Was it this, still the same script? Because I, in my mind, if he'd play the Terminator, it'd be a, like a really different movie. Well, it would, I think it would be the same movie. It would just have a different flavor to it. I, I think I think it would have been. I think what what James had in Terminator was something that was that was pure purely science fiction, 
but also big action, big adventure thing. And it was sort of, I, I still think at the time, the early 80s, that kind of genre, you know, that kind of you know, lumping those two genres together was new and, 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 and Cameron was all over it. Because if it would have been Lance, I think it would have been more, if it was Lance, I think it would have been more science fiction and less big action thing. Not, not just because Arnold's big, but, mm. but he's, he's just such an overwhelming presence. Uh, I think Lance would have made it creepier you know, a, a, a little more, um, even darker, you know, like, like the Terminator has its dark moments, but if it wasn't Arnold who, who, you know, who, who embodies that kind of big bombastic character, I think if it was Lance, it would have been even creepier some way. Yeah. It wouldn't have, I don't think it would have led to, you know, Terminator 2, which kind of capitalizes on. Yeah. That. Right. Cause it, it would, if it was Lance, it wouldn't be this at the end of Terminator <laughs> 2. It would be this and, and uh, a whole different, uh, a whole different spin. Right. Yeah. Which I have a picture of him doing that. He's wearing without your head sunglasses and he's, he's flipping me off. So. <laughs> but I love Lance Henry. He's great. But, yeah. Uh, Tristy, you have a question? Here at the podcast, we're pretty partial to practical effects, but I'm wondering how those decisions are made on a film, CG versus practical. Um, there's different ways, it, it, you know, particularly particularly now, I mean, the whole the whole CG revolution. And, and again, anything I say about CG, I'm not against CG. I'm just against the 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 idea that CG is the only answer. Uh, 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 we, we've been in these positions on films where we've said, well, okay, so on Santa Claus 2, uh, they needed flying reindeer, and they were all going to be CG. And they said, well, wait a second. You guys could build a team of reindeer like you did on the first Santa Claus movie. And, and could, you make them look, could you make them look like they're all moving? Right? The, questions, the questions just blow my mind. It's, it's like these people in movies, you, you think, okay, you're going to work on this fantasy movie about Santa Claus with with animatronic reindeers have you have you looked at any movies that are similar that have animatronics that are sort of important characters and they don't and and so they assume well the best thing for this movie to get this movie made is to shoot everything and and pack up and get out and we'll figure the rest in post so that kind of decision making is 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 born out of wanting to get out of there as quickly as you can so you can cut those seventy or eighty thousand dollars, eighty thousand, seventy or eighty thousand, uh, seventy or eighty people, right? Get them off the, get them off the, uh, the payroll, um, and then figure the rest out in post. But um, we had a great uh, a special effects supervisor when we said, look, there's one carrot we can do that. We took the the reindeer, and we put posts on, and we hooked them up to this chain winch, and you turn it on, and 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 all the reindeer now are doing this, right? So it, it was exactly what they needed. And then there was a main character, and we said, "Well, what if we do that as a puppet? We can we can build this thing programmable thing, so it looks like it's flying, and the, the body will move, and the, you know." And she and I remember she said, uh, "Well, let's cost it out." You know what she said? Let's figure out what it will cost for you guys to build it, do the control system, have puppeteers operate it, and travel and be put up in Vancouver for a couple of months of shooting. So that's a, that's a lot of things, and we came up with that cost. And then she went to the digital people and she said, okay, for this much money, how many shots can you guys do? And then she came back. I'm telling you, this is the best. This was the best uh, example of all. And I thought, this is really the way it should be done. She came back to us and said, okay, if we do it all digitally, um, for, for, you to, for you to match that, for you to balance it, you'd have to get four shots during a day. And four shots during a day, we were doing, we, we, got, we went forward, we were doing between eight and 12 shots a day. We made that all possible. The act, when, when, the, when Tim Allen was up there on the reindeer and, and the director saw that, that gave him the ability to move past figuring it all out and doing it in post and say, oh, put the camera here and then bring the camera this way. And, and there was suddenly this, this complete freedom. And, and I think that's what's, what's lacking even today in, in movies that we bid on is this, this, uh, this inclination to Let's just get everybody off the set and we'll do it in post because people actually think what we do is more expensive than CGI. And it's not. It's expensive. It's expensive, but it, it's far less than CGI to, to come up with something that we do. How did, how did that affect your career when CG started to take off? Um, the timeline was that when it started to take off with Jurassic Park, we got really busy. 
at the same at the same time that people were seeing Jurassic Park and say, oh, animatronics are dead. We were getting so many projects because that sort of opened up the horizon of what could be done. So so movies would come to like Starship Troopers was an example where where they couldn't figure out how to make that movie without CGI. And they realized, okay, now we can have these bug creatures, you know, running across the surface of this planet, but we need something big and 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 real and tactile for the actors to interact with. So so we did that, you know, we we built the uh, we built these mechanical um, warrior bugs, full size war bugs that could pick people up in their jaws and shake them. And had there not been this CG revolution that was happening at the time. That script would have just gone back on the the pile of Reddit can't do it, you know, kind of thing. Um, so so we got really really busy, and then and then slowly it started to taper off, and and CGI was taking up more and more of of of, uh, of our opportunities to work. Has that uh, changed at all? Because it does seem like there's been a, a return to practical effects in the last you know few years. Yeah. So, well, if I go back to that timeline, so after that, the next thing we knew was, was the studios were, were, would send projects over uh, with directors, very young directors, you know, like 24, 26 year old directors. And the director said, oh my God, you guys worked on aliens. You guys worked on this. You guys were, I loved all that stuff as a kid. I loved all that stuff when I was growing up. So yes, we want you to do, I want you to do my movie. And so the directors are like, yes, you know, Tom and Alec, they've got to do it. And then, the, you know, the producers would say, OK, thanks. Nice meeting. Let's go. And then the producer would, <laughs> producers would say, I just wanted you to meet them, see what you thought. But it's all going to what you're doing. It's all going to be CGI. Don't worry about it. And these guys are young enough and they're fresh enough uh, that that they can be kind of manipulated. You know, and so here's what the director wanted. The director saw it. Director thought this is going to be great in my movie. But but. People, certain people at the studios at the time said, no, 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 that's not the way we're doing movies. We have this whole pipeline of how uh, the digital stuff takes over and, and saves us um, saves us money in the end because there's not such a big crew working so long. And, uh, that, with uh, Harbor, with, you brought up Harbinger Down. Like, that's kind of how that came about, right? Because they originally, it was going to be the sequel to um, to The Thing and then they originally started with like uh, practical effects and then they moved to CG and then. Well, yeah, two different movies. The Harbinger Down was a reaction. That it was very reactionary to what had happened to us on the thing, because what happened to us on the thing is, is, is exactly what you just said. You know, again, this is, this is almost the same thrill as monster squad with the stand in the Stan Winston days. Right. They said, Hey, we're doing a, a sequel to the thing. And, and wow, I remember I didn't work on the, the first thing, the John Carpenter thing with all the Rob Bottin crazy stuff. I saw it and it just blew my mind all, you know, one thing after another. And uh, and they came to us and we thought, oh, this is going to be this is going to be amazing because um, the director had these great ideas where we're doing a prequel. And there are things there are these little like like Easter eggs left that are going to be in our movie, like like a, a, an axe that gets chopped into a wall, you know. And, and later in the, the Carpenter version, we see that ax in the wall. And, 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 um, and that's what the idea was. And we were getting, we were getting fan mail, email fan mail from, from, uh, from people, from, from guys mostly you know, saying, saying, oh, this is so exciting. They said, whatever you do, don't succumb to CGI. Like we had the final decision, right? They go, no, oh, do it all practical. That's the, what makes these things live and breathe. And, um, and we put some of our favorites up on the on the bulletin board at work, and uh, uh, and we highlighted <laughs> we highlighted things like, don't let it uh, whatever you do, don't make a CGI. And we had a meeting, and and the producers were coming through, and one of the producers from from Universal looked up, and they saw that, and they read it, and they just said, well, that'll never happen. So we already knew that the that the game in town was going to be CGI, but but thankfully. We had some some very strong producers on our on our side, you know, who were not the studio people who said said it's got to be practical. So we built everything practical. The big difference was that we were saying yes to CGI for things that would make it more uh, more capable of having an extended performance. Like for example, there's there's a character who who succumbs to you know he's he's got this thing inside him now and he. Uh, he opens. He, he falls backwards. His 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 arms have detached and run off. Right, 
and he flips over on his back and these, these big creature legs come out. And the idea was that we'll build the body and we'll animate it and we'll build a duplicate of the actor's face on a stretching neck and, and we'll do all of this, this really beautiful uh, articulation of the face. It looks just like the actor in, in misery. And the body was this beautifully sculpted human body. And, uh, and, 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 in, and we shot it all that way. And in the end, they kind of went over the whole thing. Yes, they added the legs and some of the sp specific tentacles that have to you know, come out and do this. Because if we were puppeteering that on set, it would take us too long. That makes sense. What we saw when, when Alec and I went over to the studio to see the, the, the screening, this is like two days before it opens. They went over the entire thing with this CG wash because they added the legs, they added the tentacles, but then they also felt they had to creep onto our body. So instead of it being a, a beautiful human body that, that gave away the turmoil, just the terror of this of this this precious human life, the whole thing was just this big rippling, bubbling monster. And it just, to me, it was so uh, underwhelming as a character compared to, to what it started out to be. So yeah, so that was frustrating. And, and out of that, Alec did some uh, amazing, um, crowdfunding and, and, and put together the money to do Harbinger down. Yeah. You know, the, the original, not the original thing, cause the original thing is, uh, is like from the fifties, but, uh, but, it's still, but it's still cool. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Have you guys, uh, Trist or, 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 or Tor, have you guys seen the original with, with the black and white? Oh, I love it. I, I love can't it, get right? for that movie. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so but, I love the Carpenter one too. So, like, yes, yeah, I and, love them and, both. And, really and, they, and they both and they both exist in different worlds, but but they have the same. There's something about the when the, when the creature whips open the door, and 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 they want to. I I don't want to I don't want to ruin it for Trista because I'm sure she's going to watch this tomorrow. She'll find, but right, and they're going to they're going to kill him, right? And he's smart enough. He's one step ahead of them. Literally, he jumps off. I remember the first time seeing that, my heart just started pounding. You know. There was very clever stuff in the, in that movie. Yeah, and uh, oh yeah, kind of the the Carpenter one kind of reminds me of something you're saying about Dracula, a little bit different. But uh, when I was a kid, I loved the thing because just because of the monsters. But as I got older, I appreciated much more about the movie, and I think it's really kind of a perfect movie because the acting, everything about oh, yeah. it, you can't really find a fault. It's got it's that great that blend that, of like like that. People hated it. At, well, critics hated it at the time, which is very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're often, we're, we, you know, critically, critically, a lot of the movies we work on, a lot of the movies of the genre are kind of, kind of brushed aside by critics. You know, they're not, they're not artful. They're not, um, they don't really expand the boundary. They don't really reach, they don't, they don't really present or prescribe something that's important to the world in that moment. They're just, in my mind, there's something just as important and just being, being pure fun, you know, for two hours to go sit in a movie theater and, and, and be uh, terrified. So when did it come about? You started to be the monsters in the movies. Well, I, you know, I love being the, I love being the Gill Man. I committed to it in, in such a physical way to the point where it was a one piece bodysuit with a head, hands and feet. And we would glue all that stuff together with prosthetic adhesive. And the idea is, you know, at lunchtime or when I needed to come out, we, we use a, a solvent remover to separate the wrists and the ankles. Right. And, we did that once and, and I realized, wow, that's really messing up. It's kind of tearing up the skin. I said, I said, let me just go in and stay. I'll just stay in it. Let me see how long I can stay in it. And the first time we did that um, was a full day. I stayed in it all day. I stayed in it for 13 hours. It was a long day. And, um, and that's where part of my passion was where I'm going to make sure everything about this suit stays together and looks as good as it was when we first made it. I had a vested interest by the time we started our company because I didn't want to you know, God forbid we stick a stuntman in a suit and he's doing a lousy job. And then he's also complaining about how the suit's the problem, you know. Uh, so I had a vested interest in, and I just wanted to keep doing more and more. And and um, from that moment forward, that's, you know, right after that, we, I, I, I did Pumpkinhead, Leviathan. I played the creature in Leviathan. I played the double for uh, Christopher Lloyd in an episode, episode of Amazing Stories that Bob Zemeckis directed where his head gets ripped off and Love so I'm wearing one. his costume and, and, and I'm like doing all these weird contortions so they can shoot over my back while I'm holding this head. And, and even that was great fun. I just, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, 
I loved I loved building, designing and building monsters. I also loved playing the monsters and 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 short and it wasn't very long before they just blended together in my mind that that just <clears throat> the love of really creating a character included all the way through performing. Did that affect how, when you started to design the monsters? If you knew, like, I'm going to be playing this, like, I know what I can do and how I'm going to move. I I went the other way. Knowing I'm going to be playing this character, you know, we can do away with things that would compromise it. So, for example, I know I'm going to have to be in a flying rig, you know, wires so I can do a jump or something. And stuntmen have these nylon things that they wear and they stuff lamb's wool under it so that it pads. But it, but it suddenly becomes like this thick, right? And I said... Forget that. I'll just, you know, take my chances with nylon strapping and, and no, we don't have to figure out a way to, to have a fly or something to open it so that I can have bathroom breaks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna man up. I'm just gonna hold it all day. And that's I'm basically. Fritz out the window, huh? Oh yeah, I, I, I absolutely. <laughs> I got into a point almost where, where the discomfort became the thing that I could focus on, and then I could just play the character and just not let the. Let the discomfort once, and it would it would literally the minute they would call cut, I could just suddenly feel a whole change in my body, like like suddenly I'm aware of things again. But while the cameras the cameras happening, it was all uh, it was all amazing. Yeah, is it because you know it would be hard to do that, you know, knowing someone else is going to be the in that suit. But if it's you yourself, you know, you can you know what you can handle, and you don't mind uh, sacrificing it for yourself. Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. We did. Oh, we shot Alien versus Predator, the second one. Alien versus Predator Requiem. We shot in in Vancouver in the winter in December, and we were on an outdoor set. And it started to snow and then rain, and I'm in the I'm just basically in this thin foam rubber monster costume, and I was out there on the. I stayed on this roof set, and they do a take with the actor, and then they'd run him off and put him in a heated tent, and I would just stand out there because. I had already expounded a lot of energy just climbing in around the air duct, right? And I thought, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to ignore it. But while I'm sitting there, I'm watching rain come down and freeze immediately on the set around me. But but that was the difference between me doing this and the actor who, you know, he'd muscle up to a shot and then run back into his, his warm-up tent and we'd all wait for him to get warm and then do another take. So those were the kind of things that um, that that I think actually helped me stay more committed. Mm-hmm. Was that a weird experience doing like another? Like you do Alien vs Predator, then you do another one. It's kind of like the retake of the first movie. Um, yeah, it was. You know, well, was it? Hmm, was it? There, it's not like it's not like there's a lot to mine out of the Alien character. It's mostly physical. It's just the presence and the physicality. It's not like okay, in the new AVP, we're going to see where he realizes he loves people. It wasn't anything like that. So it's just sort of. Uh, redoing redoing what I had done before, um, just in a different storytelling. Right, right. For, for, uh, uh, so when was the first time you played an alien? Was it for al- in Aliens? Uh, alien 3. Alien 3. And at that point, there's already been two alien, you know, movies. So do you, like, I'm going to try to, do you try, do you incorporate something new or do like, do you want to keep it, you know, true to the first two? Or is it? Um, I wanted to, I wanted to stay away from Aliens because having having worked on Aliens, I'm 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 a really harsh critic, you know, of my of, of my own until it reaches that point where the clock says, okay, time to finish up because this thing has to shoot in a week or whatever. But but having done the the approach we had done in Aliens, which was basically guys wearing these leotards, black leotards with some like raised sculptures of ribs and bones, and and it was very it was very stylized. And, uh, and the reason being that um, Cameron wanted to look really thin and slender, like the alien did in the first movie. But the alien in the first movie was huge. You know, he was like seven foot something, this very tall, very thin, spindly actor, performer. And, and in Aliens, they were, they were, you know, shorter, normal sized guys, but, but it was shot in a way that you didn't really, couldn't really tell. So for Alien, Alien 3, um, the approach was we wanted this alien to look like the first alien, but we wanted it to move more. The first alien couldn't really move that well. It was a construction technique that was not really uh, uh, con- conducive to him being able to perform. So we made ours out of lightweight foam rubber and it would stretch and blah, blah, blah. And so that was our goal was to 
sculpt and finish it in a way that was more reminiscent. So we sort of jumped back toward the first movie in terms of what it looked like and how it moved. Now, I, I, it's kind of a divisive movie, but I, I'm a big fan of Alien 3. Were you, were you always, did you start out being disappointed? Oh, yeah, I always, no, I actually always liked it when I went to see it at the theater as a kid and or my teens or whenever. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Because we got the thing, we, we, we understood the thing was that, that, that most people didn't like it, you know. Oh, David Fincher, too dark, too weird. And then they start to see David Fincher doing the game and they start seeing David Fincher doing um, uh, uh, Seven, right? Yeah, yeah. And then they go, oh, shit, now I understand David Fincher. And now I love <laughs> Alien 3. It made a difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember at the time, uh, some of my friends didn't like it, I don't think, at the time. But I, I always liked it. But I was always into dark stuff. So, Yeah, it's cool. It's yeah. very cool. And I love Pumpkinhead. Uh, that's one of my favorite monsters. And not just because you're here. We did a favorite monsters uh, show once, and then that was uh, on my list as Pumpkinhead. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. When people ask me what my, what my favorite character that I've ever played, I always say Pumpkinhead. And it was always because Stan was directing, and he came to you know the four of us in his shop that had been with him for many years. And he said, you guys do the monster. I got to focus on directing. And that's what we did, and that's what we came up with. And it was, it was a great uh, 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 the whole thing was a great experience. Yeah, I, I, when we Lance on, he said that was his favorite film that he worked. Who was that? With Lance Henriksen. Oh no shit! Yeah, he had a great he had a great role where he oh, got yeah. to play he's the most a, sympathetic character. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, very sympathetic. And I love the fact that he's washing his kids' hands outside, reaching around him, and he just improvised this whole thing about his grandmother's hands and how thin her skin was and how good it felt when she used to wash his hands. And, and that's, again, those are the things I look at and I think, wow, that guy commands, you know, commands scenes that way. Uh, Tris, do you have a question? You've played several gorillas. I'm wondering if you've studied gorillas, are you a gorilla expert? Related to I, gorilla. Yes. Answer. Uh, yes. I've, I've studied gorillas. I've always loved gorillas were the my were, were the main reason I would go to zoos. And I love gorillas. Am I a gorilla expert? No, I don't. Um, I mean, I know about gorillas just from watching them and studying, but I don't consider myself an expert. I think what I'm an expert in is being able to move in a way that the suit allows with, you know, arm extensions and trying to hide my long legs and still make it look like a gorilla does. So I, I found certain things that that they're able to do, you know, like they can, if they're, if they're standing up, they can, they can block their body with their, you know, these big long hair arms. And so I would do stuff like that. Um, but um, I think the, 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 uh, just the allure of them was, was, I remember, you know, as a kid, I, I always thought gorillas were the closest thing that there were to real monsters since nobody had found a Bigfoot by that time. So they go, okay, no Bigfoot. Monsters, gorillas, you know, they're just so cool looking. And I always love gorilla movies, you know, uh, even bad ones, uh, uh, early ones where people didn't even know what gorillas really looked like, you know. Um, it was always, I always, I always loved that whole feeling of, of classic old movies with, with gorillas inside. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, maybe you don't want to answer this, but because uh, you said even bad ones, do you have any like guilty pleasure monsters that, you know, maybe they aren't the best, but that you, you enjoy them anyway? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, it's funny. I, it's not so much for monsters. Just, just after I saw the, um, after I saw the, uh, uh the movie, uh, Ed Wood, you know, with, with uh, the, the, the Disney one that came out. Right. Um, I, you know, I had seen, you know, uh, plan nine from outer space once when I was, you know, late teens. And I thought, Oh, that was a stupid waste of time. And then I saw Ed Wood and I had to go back and I've seen, I think I've seen Plan 9 now twice. It's just so obnoxiously, insanely uh, amateurish, you know? Uh -huh. um, but that's, that's, a, uh, that, that's a guilty pleasure. But uh, uh, it's funny, I drive my, my wife nuts sometimes because, you know, you know, I'll be laying there at night or something. I'll think, okay, I've got my Netflix. I've got, this, I've got all this, these streaming opportunities. And I'll go and I'll do a search for like vintage gorilla movies <laughs> and a bunch will come up and I'll go, I'll start watching. Go, oh shit. I've seen this one. I'll go to another one. And then I've lost Netflix and I got to find some, then I find a great one, but I have to rent or buy it. And I'm a cheapskate. So I'll wait till next month and get it for free. <laughs> but before I know it, I've wasted 20 minutes trying to pick out a movie to watch. Uh -huh. But, but yeah, my, 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 I, I, I love, uh, I love really 
early rough um, rough monster effects. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you have any thoughts on uh, robot monster? Gorilla suit with the. Oh yeah, because you got the gorilla suit going on that one. Yeah. We, did, we did a robot monster for, um, and we did this movie at Warner Brothers. Um, uh, it was called. Uh, uh oh, what was it called? With um, hmm, Jenna Elfman. Uh, Looney Tunes back in action, right? So the movie stars and it was the the the, the, the uh, Warner Brothers cartoon characters, and they wanted to have monsters in it. So you know the 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 Metal Luna mutant from the Silent Earth, the big brain thing with the big yeah, with the that claws. That thing's great with the claws. Right? Yep. And he's wearing and he's wearing like these uh, these weird reflective pants with veins glued on the pants. Like I don't know what they were trying to say. You know, <laughs> it was weird. And I could just imagine that discussion. You know, back in the fifties. You know where where Bud Westmore was the guy, right? For on the all these old Universal movies, where it said, "I've got it, trousers, trousers with veins glued to them. That'll kick, <laughs> that'll scare the kids." But um, so so I played that one. We built that and played that one, and then uh, and then there were some other guys. Um, you know, Howard Berger, Greg Nicotero did some monsters for it, and uh, the guy uh, um, that had the original Robbie the robot. From from the old movie, um, he brought his robot in, and, and uh, so there was still one monster that was unassigned, and it was Robot Monster. And of of everybody working on it, everybody wanted to say, "I want to do Robot Monster." Everybody wanted to do the worst movie monster of all time. And I think the way we got it was because we had a gorilla suit, and we said, "We'll throw it in for free." So we got to do the diving helmet and. The only difference was Joe Dante, who was directing, wanted to have a, a blinking eye inside. So we did some animatronics. But yeah, that was, uh, 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 you know, you take all of us movie of creature effects guys and, and everybody wants to do the worst movie ever. That kind of tells you where, where our heads are at. <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, I was at a, uh, uh, they didn't do it this year, but I normally go to a 12 hour uh, horror movie marathon. It runs from midnight till noon the next day, and they always do a Halloween costume contest. And one of the people there was dressed as Robot Monster, and I thought it was amazing, but they kicked him out right away. They were like, that's stupid. But I was like, I don't know what's going on. They have yeah, no, no appreciation there. They, yeah, they have no love. Exactly. Uh, Craig Lindbergh wants to know, uh, I see he's listed on the Wonderfest website, a model-making convention. Do you make models? And if so, what type? Um, yeah, I, I do. I, I haven't done one for a while. I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm already trying to. I'm already trying to come up. In my defense, um, yeah, the, I, I started doing these models. I, I started going back, finding all these old Aurora monster models, right? Yes, those are the and best. I thought, okay, I'm going to take this model, and I could sculpt things and, and you know, clean things up, make things look a little different. And I didn't want to. I wanted it to be exactly like somebody knew how to handle a glue bottle, put it all together. <laughs> And they didn't do that much too. I shaved off the seams a little bit, but then I went to do this really bitching paint job on it. So for a while, I think uh, there's like 13 different original um, monster models that were made, you know, by Aurora in the 60s. So I had them, and I think half of them have been painted. But but I, I have not touched them for years, and I'm hoping I'm hoping there's going to be some kind of a timer that tells me when it's time to tap out, but still leaves enough time that I can go back to things that were. I was doing just for fun, like painting and sculpting and that kind of stuff. Uh, Troy used uh, Troy's my older brother. He used to collect the Aurora models. Those were the best. I love those. Although I did find out that the um, the old ones were were made out of rawhide because my my dog uh, ate <laughs> most of them. Yeah, it was a great chew toy. You know, like don't don't mind the testers' pain on there, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that that's was the they, hard way to find out. Well, that's the reason they became so expensive beca because they were they were disposable. I, yeah. I, I, I literally read somewhere that that uh, Aurora figured that 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 most kids would glue them, paint them, and then blow them up with firecrackers. <laughs> <laughs> I do that with my other ones, like the the my cars and planes and things. I blow those up with fireworks, but not my monsters. Those were precious, you know. They're, they they are precious. Uh, Tristan, do you have a question? I do. I, 
I realize we've moved on, but I have a follow-up gorilla question. So when you're uh, playing different gorillas, are you imbuing them with uh, distinct uh, personality traits or are you pretty much relying on the body language to carry that performance? Most, most of the time, I mean, that's a great question. Most of the time, the gorilla is there for, you know, a scare, like, you know, old dogs. It's, it's, it's just, it's a one note thing. Oh, these guys are stuck in the gorilla enclosure and at least it's empty, but oh no, a gorilla comes from around the corner, it's scary. Um, the, 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 the one, the singular exception was, oh, well, sorry, it's a singular exception. We also did an episode of Two and a Half Men, so that was just goofy fun. Um, but we did Zookeeper and, and I played, we built, and I played the gorilla uh, in, in Zookeeper. And, and the idea was, he, be, he was like the second lead character uh, playing to Kevin James. And that was great fun because we had a whole bunch of dialogue that we pre-programmed. The gorilla's lips and mouth would move on their own and puppeteers would operate the face and I would do all the body stuff. So we had all this great interaction. And and I realized then, like I'd almost gotten to the level of, of what I call being an actor in a suit because I was able to do different things, you know, that my body movement and try kind of explore, you know, to try to riff off of off some other things that like the, that what Kevin, that Kevin James would do. But um, the downside was that I wasn't operating the face. I was just, I was looking at a view, a, 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 a video screen inside so I could see what the cameraman was doing. So I knew how to stand to hide my legs and I knew how to do this. And, and, and it was frustrating because I would, there would be these kind of sensitive, sens sensitive moments and I wanted to do something different with the face that I had no control over. So that, while it felt better to be able to act in a suit and, and act and react and have some back and forth going, getting to that le that level of not being able to, to do the final expression was frustrating to me. But otherwise, it, it, it was my favorite performance in a film. And it, it was goofy and it was funny. You know, I got to play around. Uh, do you ever study any other animals for like uh, different roles, even, even if they're not an animal, but maybe for some movement ideas? Yeah, we we do, and 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 uh, oh my God, God bless the internet, you know where, where you could just call that stuff up, you know. Oh, I'm gonna go to YouTube, you know, show me what a show me what a deer looks like when it when it rears up on its back legs because we have to build up a front half puppet to do this and and that kind of stuff, you know, uh, compared to you know getting in the car, schlepping down to the zoo, finding the deer, which I think are, are always in the stupid part of the zoo. You know, if you see a sign that says hoof <laughs> animals. Don't even waste your time. Yeah, nobody goes man. down there. Who cares? But you know, but you go online, you find it. You go, I got it. I saw it on my computer. It must be real. Um, yeah, we do. We certainly do research on on animals that, um, even if they just appear for an effect. Hmm. Let's see, uh, Derek Neal. What's your favorite FX shot in any film you've worked on? Wow. Hmm. Um, hmm. This will disappoint some, I think. Um, because right now, because I'm thinking back on Zookeeper, but that there was a whole scene of uh, of uh, the gorilla and and Kevin James in a in a uh, TGI Fridays, just you know going crazy and and that was fun because uh, I'm just sitting in a booth across from Kevin James, so I'm not under a lot of physical constraints, but just having all this stuff to mess around like like ice cubes in the glass and water and and food and and. Uh, and just got a great reaction from everybody on set. That was that was probably the most fun that I, that I've had. What would have been the the most the, the hardest thing to pull off? I guess the hardest thing was um, the movie Leviathan, um, which was kind of a thing on a ship or a, a thing on a on a on a under underwater um, uh, structure, you know. But but that was that was miserable because to back into this thing. You know, and then I'm down. It's, it's on. It's on wheels because we never really showed it climb or work, work from climb from point A to point B. But I had to. My back had to be arched, and we had these fiberglass rods, and and so it was just. It was just totally miserable. You know, I would just get crouched. You know, knocked down for hours, and 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 very little that I could do with my arms to be able to, to, to release anything. I was strapped to it, and then we're working on a set. We're over at the studio in Rome which was great the traveling has been great but we're working at a studio in Rome and we have all these water effects and we have all this grid work where the creature are chasing these people down and and we've got you know effects happening and electricity sparking and stuff and I'm standing on this metal grate 
and I just feel a surge of electricity go through me. Somehow they were shorting out the entire stage, you know, periodically. I think three or, I think three or four hit before I, I finally got somebody's, you know, attention and they found out what the problem was. But that was um, even without the even without the uh, electric boosts, <laughs> um, it was a miserable, a miserable thing to try to perform. And yeah. Uh, I don't know much you could talk about, you know, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, but uh, just uh, the idea of, you know, uh, working on, on, you know, Godzilla movies again, like, uh, that has to be pretty cool for someone who grew up watching, you know, monster movies. Well, yeah, the last one, you know, was, um, we, we, they had their main, Godzilla was already done. He was already in the bag. And, and uh, the director, uh, um, Michael Doherty, reached out to us and two other companies and, assigned the monsters. He was such a, he was such, he, he's a monster kid. You know, he loves all this stuff. And, and he said, I want all you guys to be working on this. So he let us do, he, he, he turned Rodan over to us and he turned Mothra over to, I think Stan's team and uh, Ghidorah to, to uh, 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 another artist. Um, so we all had a chance to do it. Then on, uh, on uh, Kong versus Godzilla or Godzilla, I think it's Godzilla versus Kong. Yeah. You have to get Godzilla and his prop. Yeah. Um, I'm more of a Kong guy. But. I am too. We 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 didn't work on. We didn't do anything on Kong. We there were, we, we we did some design and stuff, but but uh, nothing that really really uh, spoke to or influenced Kong or or, or Godzilla. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do Rodan, though, like is that like so? You want to keep it true to the original, I assume. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and luckily, the studio was with us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all that stuff was fun in the 60s, you know, who, who knew, you know, I, I think I think what I think what they were doing at Toho Studios in the 60s was was not as successful as what what we were doing. in, in this. I mean, if you just care compare the timeline, but um, because I think when I think of monsters in the 60s, you know, it, it, we've gotten past some of the, the early bad stuff and, and you know. Ray Harryhausen, you know, Ray came and rescued the genre, and uh, he had some st great stuff throughout the '60s, and and uh, um, you know, some great makeup stuff, Planet of the Apes, and and I think that was really a a, a, a pivotal decade in which on-screen monsters were suddenly becoming really, really engaging and, and realistic to the story. Do you have a favorite Harryhausen effect? I mean, to me, the skeleton scene still one of the greatest scenes in any movie. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I don't. I know. I know the the, the two movies that I watch most often. The two movies. Now I'm going to name three. The three three of the two movies that I love the most are uh, uh, Twenty Million Miles to Earth because I just thought that had some of the most intricate setups, especially mm -hmm. when that creature is is is. Uh, being born out of that weird jelly jelly sack, right? Um, well, that one tiny I, in that too. Yeah, it is right. It's it's beautiful. And then um, uh, the Cyclops from Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And then the other one, I just I, I absolutely love Golden Voyage of Sinbad. I just there's something about the story and the characters, you know, uh, uh, um, and it just seemed more real. They like. Like Kerwin Matthews, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, it was very fantasy inspired. It was still very, you know, it was, it was not a, a, a disrespectful movie to that to that genre. It was, it was great. But there was something that rang true to me about Golden Voyage of Sinbad and talk about uh, preordained existence and, and, and direction in life. And the characters were all fun. The animation uh, creatures were good. And John Philip Law had a feeling there was, there was something about him that, that seemed almost Persian as, as, as well, you know, as, as the, uh, uh, some of the other characters, which most of them were just Spanish uh, actors, but, but it just, it just gelled for me, you know, that it, it seemed very, uh, very complete. Is there any monsters that you've wanted to, to make that you haven't had the chance to yet? Um, well, yeah. Uh, I, I want to make Pumpkinhead too. You know, I want to I want to do the sequel to Pumpkinhead, and I don't want to be in the suit. And 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 I want somebody that's younger and and thinner than I am. And and I want to I want to write and direct it. I think there's I actually did a treatment that I complete. Of course, I fall in love with it. You know, I think how can this not work? And then I talk to people who have the rights, and I realize uh, why it can't work. Um, but to me, that's that right now would be the dream job is to, is to be able to 
go back and, and recreate a character that was very early in my career. My son's become a, a, a performer, right? Put him in and, and me direct and, and just and just start it all over again from a different whole different point of view, like more, more like an origin story. Hmm. Troy, he, he, I'm putting him on the spot, but he does a really good impression of the witch in uh, Pumpkinhead. <laughs> you gotta let it run its course, said Holly. I love that. <laughs> That's pretty good for being on the spot. Yeah, I like to embarrass. Him, but uh, yes, is directing something you'd like to do more of? Yeah, yeah. I had a great experience with with a, a feature called Fire City um, to sell. You know, it, it didn't go theatrical. It went, it went on you know video on demand, and I think it's on oh it's on Amazon or but but, but they they retitled it Fire City End of Days to make it sound like. This is more than just a city on fire, man. It's the end of days. So, so, but I loved it. It was it was super low budget. Um, basically, ended up doing all of the creatures of lots of makeup. We had a huge makeup crew. No surprise. Um, uh, but um, it was just this really cool story of these demons that 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 exist on a plane that we don't see. Like we see a guy in a hallway, but he's actually a demon. And they all live in this big decrepit apartment building with real human beings. And the way they survive is they live off the misery of these people in this horrible tenement, right? But they got to keep themselves secret. But something happens to disrupt the, 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 the natural flow of, of, their, of their plane and the human plane. And this one demon character has to go to the human plane to fix things. And... And I literally, I, I was running from shot to shot. I told my actors right up front, I said, you just got to bear with me. We had, I think we had like two weeks of rehearsals, but I said, bear with me. I'm, I can almost guarantee I'm going to spend more time setting up the camera than I am shooting you, you know, because we have so much to do and we have such little time and, and everybody pulled with me, you know, to do that, to make it possible. And I'm there. I'm really proud of some things in that movie, you know, it's uh, it, it, for it. For a first feature, I'm, I'm I'm very proud of the work. I remember that uh, um, I think it was October Coast uh, was doing the PR for that uh, when it came out. But I remember the title actually made me think uh, that it was a sequel because usually, you know, uh, instead of part two, they put you know the subtitle after that. Yeah, I thought of that. I, yeah, it's funny. I thought, what if you made it? If you're going to make a genre movie, why not call it the something part two? You know, or the something final chapter, and people think, "Oh, I can't, I can't miss it." Yeah, <laughs> but I have to go back and watch all the rest, though. Now <laughs> the final one. There was a, I, it's nothing to do with anything, but there was a movie came out a few years ago, and it was the second part of a trilogy. They were going to make a trilogy, and they did the second part first, so it opens up like a cold opening, so you don't know, you have no backstory, and then it ends. I have to say it didn't work, but I like the idea behind it, behind wow. what they were doing. But it's a, it didn't really work because like you didn't know anything about the backstory. They just open and like they're being yeah. chased by like the killer. It's like watching like Jason, you know, part three or four without without ever seeing any of the other ones. But it was an interesting idea. But I have to say the movie didn't really work. That happens a lot <laughs> from what I see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Tucker um, wants to know: Did you ever, have you ever uh, you cast actual animals to make molds for creatures, aliens? No, no, no. It it, um, it just it, you know, there's there's nothing about that that would be good for the animal in any way. You know, the uh, it just it just wouldn't work. We what the the most most we will do is is we'll bring an animal in and we'll take photographs and measurements to make it perfectly accurate. You know. Yeah. Uh, speaking of animals, Trista had her cat there. Do you have a? Do you or the cat have a question, Trista? Oh yeah, he's he hasn't had a question. He's patiently listening. He's praying. <laughs> I think he likes it. Um, my question is: Do you have advice for anyone who might want to follow in your footsteps? Mm. Yes. Do I have advice? Um, it's funny. I, I, well, of course I do, right? Of course I do. Do, do I feel? Do I feel um, like I'm the guy to to share? I mean, there's you know, there's some great guys that, that have done some some really great work, um, but um, I, you know, I, I did a I did a lesson for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, which is really a great 
organization. Um, and, and I'd say if people are interested in this whole field and they have not yet gone there, that's just, uh, you know, they should find it. It's online. But I did a lesson for about suit performance. So, so you know, I feel if I say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have nothing, anything to say. It's not being, I, I don't want to be disingenuous to what I did say in this lesson. I took it, I took it kind of light because it, because it seems like kind of like, you know, I don't want to be the guy going, let me tell you about wearing rubber monster suits. So I, I just, you know. But it's it's mostly it's just mostly the physical commitment, you know. I I've always I've always worked to try to to keep in shape because I love the work. Um, I know there's going to be a point where uh, where I'm not working as much anymore, and, and maybe that's why psychologically, you know, I'm thinking how can I how can I be involved? I'm already at this level. How could I do this level? And I think it's directing. But but just being physically active and and learning, you know, I've spent so much time in front of a mirror. Um, full length mirror to see to see what it looks like when my body feels like this, you know, or, you know, so basically so I can understand how to move in such a way that is evocative of anything that's not human, particularly the more human the creature suit is, the more it's got two arms and two legs and a head, the more it has to not move like a like a like a human being. So I find ways to do that. And 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 one of the things that, that I've loved was was um, thinking of these kind of comic book frames when, when I get to a point, like, like if the creature's coming up on person, right. And the creature suddenly stops. I never want to just stop and be there. Right. I, I'll always, I'll always end up with some kind of a, some kind of a, of a cool dynamic pose. Right. And, and, and I, I believe in doing that. So that again, if, if particularly if you're, if you're going to stop moving, you want to look cool even when you're not moving. So that's the, that's the, the biggest thing is just being, having an awareness, you know, of where your presence is. Interesting. Uh, uh, what did you do for it? The movie it? Um, we, we actually just, we basically, there was a design that Andy Muschietti came up with the director. There was just a brilliant design. It was in pencil and he had done a test, a very simple test without prosthetics. And we just sat down with him and said, Okay, well, here's what we could do. Your design shows this, you know, it's like like trying to 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 get the feeling of a of a baby, you know, of a of a of a, of a child. And we said, let's do a slightly, you know, you have a you have a big forehead, so we can do a prosthetic there, and we can do prosthetics that that round out his cheeks a little bit, and and even a little thing on his nose, and 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 this little cherub looking thing. But the color was there, the orange hair, the white skin. Um, we we you know. We probably had a lot of mileage if we would have if we wanted would have wanted to run and say we design we designed Penny or we design, we just we we designed Pennywise but we didn't and we just we just enacted and made that sketch come to life and it was a, a, a great experience for us to be able to be be involved. Uh, when you watch movies that you worked on, can you watch? Do you watch them as movies or is it more like you know kind of looking at the technical side and then? I still look at them as movies because. Um, I won't, I won't often watch a movie that I've worked on unless there's a reason to, unless, you know, we have friends over or the relatives are over. Like, you know, if I got nephews and nieces uh, who have never seen a thing, a thing I've done, I used to pull those movies out and show them. And, um, but it's always been, you know, I will see movies and I will remember what was happening that day or earlier in that scene, you know, and, and it kind of kind of ref, ref, refresh my memory of, of, of all these different experiences I've had. It's really a, it's really a great way to uh, to be able to kind of uh, appreciate what what you've gone through in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, besides uh, gr uh, old gorilla movies, uh, are you watching anything currently that stands out to you? Um, it, not in the creature world, you know. Oh, you know what? This is so weird. So okay, I'm gonna get close. Come here. When I was a kid watching these scary movies, there it was hard to find, right? There wasn't that much stuff going on. And I thought, oh, I would kill for a good zombie movie, right? Oh, I'd love to see some great supernatural creature like crawling through the woods. And now here we are today where, where almost everything that you can pull down off of Netflix or, or you know, is some scary thing, right? Like, right? you know, no, no harm done by the walking dead, but but oh my god, enough. You know, I agree. Who's, who, okay, who's not making zombie movies out there today? Who's not doing? It's like it's like it's like way too much for me. It's way too much, and and um, this is where I start rambling like an old man. But <laughs> it's like the what used to make it special is gone. It's it, everything is too immediate. You know, it's just too 
That's what. That's why I will sit. I will. I will spend twenty minutes looking for a movie to watch because everything seems to be, you know, from in this. It's it's all in the same genre. So it's like, how many times, you know? So that that is a little bit. Um, it's it, it's kind of anti. Uh, an anti uh, have and not even having the love of monsters because now there's too many to love. You know, the zombie thing, especially because that that's just everywhere and. Uh... Like you said, oh, when I grew up, I loved Dawn of the Dead, and uh, it was like a, a real dark movie. And but but you know, but, but you know what's but, you know what's, but so, but so did so did Greg movie. Nicotero. Greg Nicotero loved the original, and and look at what he did. You know, wow, that, that, that guy is 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 like the king of that world. He he's a spokesman for that world, and he's going off, and, you know, with Creep Show, and and I think you know, good for him and, and Howard Berger, you know, his partner who 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 has to run the shop and create all that stuff. There's to me, there's nothing more satisfying than than seeing somebody who you've come up through the ranks with just say, "That's it, I love zombie." That's why I'm saying, "That's it, I love Pumpkinhead." I want to do I want to do the next yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's that that freedom of uh, of creative choice. Mm -hmm. And I also like the Walking Dead comic book. If you go back to the real old shows, I said the what this comic book would make a great television show. Really? Yeah, I think they they des cool. I deserve some kind of uh, compensation. <laughs> I used to watch Family Ties, and I would say, "At Michael J. Fox, it's going to be a movie. <laughs> this is this is sad but real. That kid's going to be a movie star someday. <laughs> Especially if you put a DeLorean in there." <laughs> I was Christopher wrong. Lloyd, I was we're good with, to go. Yeah, I was wrong with Teen Wolf, but then things started to gel with the uh, Back to the Future movies. Yeah, yeah. still time, I guess. Uh, so uh, it's a weird time right now, are you, but are you working on anything currently? Um, we're about to start a movie. I say we're about to. We're ready to start a movie as soon as the studio, uh, as soon as they go from blinking green to a full green light. And it's it's nothing that I can talk about yet. Um Certainly, but um, I'd be glad to come back when I can because it's uh, it's actually it's a very exciting project for us. It's uh, without money, you know, wanting to. I'm not trying to tease, but you know, it's oh, it's it's very cool. It's really came out of nowhere for us, and and uh, it's it's going to be very interesting. Oh, very cool. And uh, can people? Uh, are you on social media for people to follow you? I am. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, it's uh... <laughs> oh shit. I should have looked it up. Actually, I'm not far away from being able to look that up. I'm I'm mostly on Instagram, and and embarrassingly enough, I'm still on Facebook. I um, what? Why? I prefer Facebook. <laughs> I have to. I'm on I'm on Facebook, right? And I have to tell people, um, tell people my family, don't post, don't comment. I don't I don't need that. So okay, so my Instagram is Tom underscore Woodruff Jr. All right. Very good. All right. So if you hit that, you'll probably see I'm looking at stuff now. I kind of jumped in on that whole uh, Bernie Sanders meme thing. I was um, a big fan of those. Oh, yeah. I love them. So, the, so, yeah, I did one where I took the uh, <laughs> Bride of Frankenstein with Frankenstein monsters sitting in that big stone chair. Right. And I took everything, the, the chains, I put Bernie Sanders in, and then people going, going, Oh, it's clear what your feelings are. It's like, no, this is. Don't you understand what this picture came from? So, uh, yeah, I've, I've I've got to get back to. Um, it's hard to find the time right now to to get back to to doing something creative, but but hopefully that'll be starting up soon. Yeah, well, very cool. One last question here in the uh, chat room. So, I, I hopefully this makes sense. Change Band wants to know. What was it like playing Batman in the film Mattress of Solitude? Oh, it was, oh, it was, it was, uh, I almost said embarrassing. That's not fair. Shannon Shea did a great job. It's a very funny short. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. No. Yeah, look it up. Look that that up. Yeah. yeah, well, look, yeah, look it up. It's, it's, uh, it was tough. Alec, you know, the, uh, the other head of, uh, ADI does a great, does a great TV Superman, you know, and, and, Shannon, the director, wanted to, you know, wanted to have Batman. He knew I loved Batman, so he said, "I'll make the costume." Yeah. And I said, "All right, great. I'll I'll do the best Adam West I can." And uh, we ended up. We didn't have the headpiece quite right. It wasn't like the real headpiece from the TV show was like this fiberglass shell and right and uh, very distinctive. But but we did it, and uh, I don't know. I did the best I can. I thought, oh, that's fine. It's kind of like an inside joke kind of thing. And then the next thing I noticed was 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 it's it's posted on my on my 
uh, uh, IMDB listing, right? And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if that's what I want producers <laughs> and directors seeing. Uh, and uh, don't hate me, Shannon, but but there was about a week that I spent trying to find a way. I I I, can't, I couldn't pull it off. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very hard. Yeah, I wanted to lead. I said, oh, this is something. I was doing it with a friend. That, you know, it was kind. Of, I thought it was kind of an inside joke kind of thing, and and they just said. No, it stays. So and I'm glad it does now. It's like I'm, I'm much more confident now with with I'm much more confident with my Adam West impersonations. But I'm not going to fall for the uh, doing it uh, the way Troy did his. Uh, all right, all right. Maybe yeah, he'll subtle time. that way. He'll sneak it in on you. That's right. You'll know, you know me better by next time when you come on. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll get it then. Uh, you can. You should also go to our. We have a YouTube channel. It's called Studio ADI. We have. We have so many millions of views it's, it's basically all of our behind the scenes stuff oh, nice. but if you go there you'll find personal subjects personal projects like like i have one in there called uh, uh batman 10 xl where i took the, the this big fat blob suit from from x-men origins you know the blob oh, yeah. character right Fred and, I had, and, and, and i had this custom TV batman costume built and a proper head and i'm just wandering around hollywood boulevard <laughs> Uh, and it's so bizarre. I did that. I also got I, a, a good friend of mine, Bob Burns, is a is a collector, a vast collector. Oh, he's, uh, he's, from you know, the, Bob, the right? Man. From the yeah, so he used to be on Sci-Fi Buzz. Yeah. Yeah. He's oh, oh he's he's just a, a, a font of of knowledge and emotional. The impact of of all this stuff. But he let me borrow. He let me borrow the original animation armature of Mighty Joe Young. Oh, nice. He said you should you should do some animation with nice. this. He said, Really? Me? Really? <laughs> so I took it to ADI on my, it was on my 50th birthday. And I spent the, the weekend animating this sh short little sequence. And I took it back and I said, I showed him he loved it. I said, Bob, that was, uh, I just, I feel bad. I'm worried that, that real animators are going to get kind of, kind of uh, tweaked because how dare you, you know, how dare you, mm -hmm. you know, bring this thing back to life. So Bob goes, ah, don't worry about it. Here, now do Kong. So I took, <laughs> I took Kong home. There's a beautiful, there's a beautiful film. I did two things with Kong. I did a, a short called Inside Kong, which shows you the original armature that I repositioned to match Kong in the background. And that's just a short clip of it's it's just cool to see Kong and see his armature. But I did one, I did another one called called Kong Steel in Love, which is about this steel skeleton that is still in love with Fay Ray and he comes to life. And and it's beautiful because I have I, I, in in a in a short film. I was able to evoke this really almost like this painful uh, love that he had for something that he would never have. So that that's probably the uh, thing I'm most proud of, you know, is my own personal my own personal projects. I love it. That's cool. That yeah. was yeah. the last movie I got to, to see it. in a theater before the pandemic was uh, was the, Kong, King yeah. Kong. Was what? The original King Kong. They did a Fathom Events for it, right? That's right. Oh, that's so weird because I'm actually in Pennsylvania right now. I'm going back and forth now with as much as I can with, with the social distancing and, and being safe. But I came here, you know, about two years ago with that Fathom events. I reconnected. This was before COVID, you know, took yeah, off, like you said. Yeah. And, uh, and they said, hey, they're, you know, Fathom events is releasing King Kong. And I said, dudes, I'll meet you. The the Let's go see this thing. And next thing I know, it got canceled in our in, oh, our, no. in our state so yeah, i think i think the next day r literally the next day is yeah when closed down the yeah it'd be great and yeah. it was such a nice clear print like i had never seen it like that oh, before yeah. it was so good and i've seen it a million times but yeah 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 me too keep watching it yeah i tried to get ray harryhausen on the show many times in the when we first started the show but unfortunately it never worked out really yeah the one time it almost did, but it, it it was the same time as his 90th birthday. And I was like, oh, that's too uh, bad. Uh, yeah. Wow. So, so how long have you been doing this, Neil? I know you sent this info. Yeah, since 2006. Wow. Good for you. And I see and I see you've won a rondo back there. Uh, Wait, no. no. But, but, uh, Wait, no? We should. We, let's get yes, you should. Yeah, I know. In fact, I would, I, would slide, I would slide that guy out of the way and make room. 
Be positive. Yeah. Be, that's right. your I'll, mind. Right? I'll make a space here, and when people ask why is that empty, I said that's the, that's the Rondo space. That's you know, yeah, going to be the Rondo I, Hatton Award right there. I will to I will totally I will totally follow this because this has been a great uh, this has been a great interview. Great questions. Well, I did, I, I'm sure we it's all a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's it's nice to meet you guys and and, and to be able to spend some time. You're good. So keep in touch, and, and I'll do the same. Let you know when something cool comes up. Yeah, so yeah, we look forward to, to seeing you again. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Take care. All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Good night, Neil. Good night, Troy. <laughs> I'm trying to stop this. Oh, there we go. <laughs>